I would like to be buried alive by Jess Reynolds. Spirit, plant me. Part the soil until there's room for me to curl up around myself and wait. I know there's life sleeping somewhere in this sea, just waiting for water and sun. Spirit, plant me. This is our covenant. You on your knees, up to your elbows in dirt. Me, stripped bare of bark or shell, risking wind and snow to give myself the chance to grow. So I've been reading uh, Brian Swim's latest book. He's a cosmologist, and he's imagining. He, his, one of his big works is the universe story that he wrote with Thomas Berry. He's trying to tell a mythological version of, of, of the whole story of the universe that weaves science and, and, and mythos. And this latest book is his, his autobiography, his remembering. He realizes near the beginning of it, I, I, didn't, I left myself out of the story. And so he's sharing where he came to the ideas that he came to. And he shares with, with passion and excitement the revelation, the scientific revelation that the cosmic microwave radiation from the Big Bang is still happening here and now. That we can see with the instruments we have now and the mathematical equations how the light and the background radiation is the same impulse, the same creative process that has been going on since the Big Bang, since everything started. And how amazed he was by this, this sort of childlike glee from a mathematics professor with a wife and kids. And I've been thinking about all those moments in our lives when we have those, those kind of epiphanies of, of everything fitting together. Do you know what I'm talking about? Moments where it just feels like, oh, it's all, it's all right. It all makes sense. <laughs> it doesn't last very long, or at least it doesn't for me. But, but you get this glimpse as if the whole universe was telling a story that made sense. When my mom, Laurel, came out to her mom, Lillian, uh, the, the, the big, as, as a lesbian, the big um, tragedy for Lillian, my grandma, was that she always thought Laurel would make such a great mother. This is what she told her. I, I just, I'm only sad because I thought you'd make a great mother, which you already know how this story turns out, I guess. But, uh, <laughs> But what I, I remember most is my mom telling me about the newspaper clipping that a few years later as sort of a, a reconciliation, because the story, of course, didn't end there. The newspaper clipping that her mom sent her about the sperm bank of California, which was going to serve especially lesbian couples who wanted to have kids, and how she clipped out that, that newspaper clipping and sent it to my mom. My mom treasured it. It was this sign that the story hadn't ended. And she kept it in her purse, and she, it was so, you know, it was such an important object that even when her purse got stolen, she searched the neighborhood that it got stolen in, searching through dumpsters trying to find this newspaper clipping. Now the money, you know, cares, but this symbol that the story didn't end. They did use the Sperm Bank of California. They tried, you know, several different donors. And um, this is, uh, you know, uh, uh, maybe TMI for Sunday morning at church, but here you go. They, 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 they got a call after trying for years, and they'd gone back and forth, and they got a call that said, oh, have I got the donor for you? High motility, high sperm count. If you don't know what motility is, you didn't try and conceive this way. Uh, and, 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 and that was the donor. Dennis Luan is his name. I didn't find that out until 21 years later. Dennis Luan was the donor for a number of us, um, donor siblings. And one of them, 
also I did not know at the time was my, my best friend growing up for a while, Daniel, and we went met at Camp It Up and, and we had a hard time separating at the end of our queer family camp week because we would cling to each other and, and tell our moms, we're brothers. <laughs> and, and, and in fact, we, we, we were, we are. <laughs> they found that out when we were teenagers, this, these moments, right? Wow, this all, it all fits. And then Daniel, it was Daniel who organized us all last summer, donor siblings and Dennis himself to get together for a little camping trip. And amazing to sit around the circle, around the fire, and tell stories of our lives and hear stories of Dennis' life and hear about the, my brother making a, a, a career out of hiking around uh, his PhD work in Alpine Lakes after Dennis had spent his career hiking around describing as an editor for Backpacker and Outdoor Magazine these alpine hikes. Amazing to hear about his undergrad degree in religion. <laughs> Most amazing of all, on one of those hikes that my brother and, and Dennis took together, they put it together that his family had, when they first came, Eastern European Jews to the United States, they'd ended up in a little town called Glasgow, Montana. It's the same town that my grandmother Lillian grew up in. Tiny little town in Montana. And not only that, when Laurel went to go look at the, the three-volume set that her mom had kept of the history of Glasgow, Montana, which if anybody needs to borrow that, let me know. But <laughs> there was an entry for many of the families, and there were the Luans, the one Jewish family in town, who just so happened to be friends, mentioned in this three-volume set, close friends with the Weedhams, my, my mom's family. A hundred years apart, and yet this cosmic background radiation, this way that the moment now was already there in the seeds that were sown generations ago. So there's those moments where it all feels like cosmic destiny. And then, of course, there's the moments when it all just feels like it can't be real. When the horror and tragedy feel like uh, anything going on is an affront to life itself. Do you know those moments too? I had one of those recently. I've been telling you about my, my best friend who died, my adult best friend suddenly and shockingly, and I remember just that feeling driving home from his house with a night that, that we found him dead, that the police had found him, driving home and feeling like it was wrong that anybody was out on the streets living life, like it was wrong that life could continue on. Like everything in that moment of tragedy and, and horror should just stop. And I think we all have those moments where we just want everything to stop. And it might be because something tragic's happened, or it might be because we want to just collect ourselves. <laughs> There's just too much. We need it all to slow down and stop for a minute, to catch up. And, and uh, my, my drama teacher always tells me, David White, I haven't heard David White say it, but my drama teacher, I trust him, he says, David White says, the universe is too compassionate for that, to stop. That The universe knows that would be a true death, a, a, an ending without a rebeginning, and, and so life does go on. The story does continue. Something always happens next. This is how Reverend Kendall Gibbons says it. She says, the humanist speaks of Easter. There are only two things we know for sure. One, they stashed Jesus' body in a tomb temporarily until they could get a chance to bury it properly. And when they came back, the tomb was empty. Make of that what you will. There are many possible explanations, some more likely than others. I don't believe, she says, that Jesus came back from the dead. Neither did Martin or Malcolm. 
Neither did Viola Luzzo, the Unitarian woman who was killed in Selma or Frozan Safi, the women's rights activist shot by the Taliban in Afghanistan last November, neither will the dismembered journalist Jamal Khashoggi or Alexei Navalny when he dies in a Russian prison. Neither will documentary filmmaker Brent Renault or photographer Maxime Levin, both killed by invading armies in Ukraine. Kevin Strickland and Lamont McIntyre, wrongfully imprisoned, will not get back the stolen decades of their lives. I don't believe, she says, that the crucifixion is a story with a happy ending or that it was a one-time event. It happens over and over as the human journey unfolds. It happens to us, to the people we love. It happens to the righteous and the innocent. Crucifixion happens, and it feels like the end of the world every time. And it feels like nothing could matter anymore ever. And then, inevitably and miraculously, something happens next. Something happens, of course it does because the world hasn't ended yet. It's not always an empty tomb. How trite would that become? Mostly, the beloved bodies just lie right there, peacefully decomposing. But something happens, and whether we want it or not, a new chapter begins. Maybe the sun comes up, or the lilies do. Spring rolls around, that happens or memories come, or someone needs you. You eat food, that happens. You walk down the road and share a recollection. Life happens, keeps happening. The dead don't rise, but we do. One day, it happens. You take a breath and it doesn't hurt to breathe. You start to see people again, really see them. Hope rises, community rises, you rise, we rise, life rises. Not because death isn't real. Crucifixion is not just pretend, but something else is just as real, maybe even more real. Something happens next. That is the other thing we know for sure. Life rises, outrage rises, love rises, faith rises, tears rise, hope rises. This I do believe. We know that death is inevitable. I think probably even trauma is inevitable, a part of the fabric of life. Joy and woe are woven fine the seeds even of our own death, even of our own suffering are planted in our being born and generations further back. But the crucifixion, it's not inevitable. The violence of oppression, the state-sponsored violence of police murders and racist wrongful convictions, the condemnation of love or identity. These are seeds and fruit of a different kind. And I think about these old stories this month. I was at Seder last night telling that story, and we tell this Easter story this morning. And in that Seder story, you know, the, the, the journey out, there's a couple of moments that always, like, the, I, I struggle with them. There's the moment when, when Moses murders the Egyptian man. Do you know what I'm talking about? Like, he's, he sees the Egyptian slaver, and he's just so outraged in the moment, he can't help himself, and he kills him. And he ends up out in the desert. And then there's the moment when 
the army is following the Israelites as they're fleeing. They finally are, are, are leaving and they've gone fast. They, 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 they didn't leave time to leaven their bread. They've got the matzah on their backs and they're, and they're gonna cross the Red Sea and they do and, and somehow it opens and they're celebrating their freedom, their liberation on the other side while the army of Pharaoh is washed and drowns in the sea. And I've just always struggled with this sense of, of my God would, would make another choice. My God would, would have more compassion than that. But there's this piece, it was in our Haggadah last night, this tradition in the Jewish teachings that there were angels then who celebrated, who were rejoicing at Pharaoh's army being washed and drowned in the Red Sea, and God rebuked them. Rebuked them for celebrating. A necessity, perhaps, but it's one thing to celebrate your liberation, another to celebrate the suffering and punishment of another. It's like, I think that understanding that that, 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 that slaver, that, that man who Moses killed, understanding those, that army, understanding that they reaped what they sowed is one thing. But rejoicing in their suffering is another. That's how we plant those seeds of vengeance. And I know, I know it's satisfying, I know why. I mean, I feel it myself, Trump, I want him cuffed and, and, and humiliated with his mugshot, and you know, we want that moment of satisfaction. But those seeds of vengeance, they have a way of, of growing in the heart, they have a way of becoming another trauma yet for generations down the road to suffer through themselves. Accountability, yes. Rejoicing in vengeance, no. When we water those seeds of vengeance, we beget more vengeance. When we desire to rejoice in another's suffering, no matter the reason, We've lost touch with, with their humanity and, and our own. And my, my, my hunch is that when that's what's happening for us, when we want that, there's grief that we haven't been willing or able to let ourselves feel in the way. And it's through grieving, through lamentation, that we return to life, that we become able to, like Jesus said on the cross, forgive them, they know not what they do. I don't know if he said it, but I, there's something powerful about that idea of even in the most extreme suffering to be able to stay connected to one's own humanity and those of your oppressors. when we're connected to ourselves and to life, when we allow life to flow through us and not stuck in trying to make the past different from what it was, then, then the response we feel to tragedy and violence is not vengeance, but lamentation. Lamentation that holds within it the hunger for accountability alongside the release of mercy. Accountability and mercy together water the seeds of justice. And I think of that moment, that image that's been painted countless times of the Marys, Mary Magdalene, and Mother Mary, and Mother of Mary, Mother of James, and, and, and Salome, I don't know why she wasn't named Mary too, weeping, <laughs> standing around and weeping and rending clothes and wailing. And as Lynn's story shared, and, and so many of these folktale, the tradition tells us that in that moment, in the midst of their lament, is when they became aware of the resurrection. 
And I think when I first heard that story, I don't know how long ago, it seemed like a weird kind of like gotcha moment. Like, oh, you were crying, but look, he's awake. It, but what I think really is happening, it's a deeper reflection on the necessity of lamentation for the joy of resurrection. Our tears and our grieving is what's necessary to bring us back to life. Joy and woe are woven fine, clothing for the soul divine. I don't believe that Jesus came back from the dead, neither did Martin nor Malcolm. Crucifixion happens. And it feels like the end of the world every time. It feels like nothing could matter anymore, ever. And then something happens next. Maybe the sun comes up, or the lilies do. Spring rolls around, or memories come, or someone needs you. Hope rises. Community rises. You rise. We rise. Life rises. Because not because death isn't real. Crucifixion is not just pretend, but because something else is just as real, maybe even more real, something happens next. Jim Crow was not the end of the story. Mass incarceration is not the end of the story. Don't Ask, Don't Tell was not the end of the story. Dobbs is not the end of the story. Anti-trans legislation, not the end of the story. Something happens next. Life rises, outrage rises, love rises, faith rises, tears rise, hope rises. Seeds rise, flowers bloom and then wilt. And yet, seeds always rise again. Amen. Blessed be.